the Twitter Top 100 conversation with Ty, a gripe that's got to go, how much we improve, some NBA talk as well, a tweet that made me go, mm, and then you can decide if I'm too sensitive, and a little football talk. It's all next on today's edition of Tip Off. I read really good stuff that's not sports related, and then I wonder if I should actually tell you about it. You can see, I might read it as interesting, but if someone has a bias and then they get bothered by it, then they're mad at me, not at the author. So often it's not even worth telling you about it. So maybe I'll just do it and you don't listen. Um, so on that note, Charles Pierce, who's one of the best writers out there, usually for Esquire, uh, definitely usually leans left, just in his writing, wrote a really, really interesting piece about how Mitt Romney's uh, governorship and how good it was and all the things he did that partic- that changed kind of what he thought were important and what he talked about after he left and how, what a great governor he was and how he led various different things and how inside this campaign he's not been able to take, for whatever reason, he's not, the Republican Party isn't letting him take any credit for the things that he did so well in Massachusetts. So I thought it was really fascinating. read it last night. Um, I thought it was more fascinating just kind of on how the uh, political juggernaut starts and gets going and you probably don't get a chance to be who you are. I need to close the door. So for those of you on YouTube, I'm getting up for a quick second. For those of you on audio, thank you. How is everybody today? Um, we are going to add, as we continually try to upgrade the kind of locked on jazz experience and interaction, we are going to add, you can mark this down, I will promote it as time goes on, we are adding a lock vet line. The concept behind this, if anyone wants to try it out today, that would be great, because then I'll see if it's working. Uh, the idea is that the end of the Utah BYU game, if you'd had a thought, but b- better for NBA, but that, that was just the most recent big event. So after Jazz opener last year, <laughs> ah, um, what uh, you would pick up the phone and you would call 801 200 801 200 and leave your message. Then I will be able to um, play it back, react to it. All that kind of stuff. It also allows for some great creativity and some other stuff. I uh, thought it would be fun to try to get you guys more involved in that. Uh, Sports Illustrated's dedicating the entire week to Twitter, which certainly has changed the way things are covered and, and done. And I feel like we've got a good mix. We've got the blogs, Julia, and Twitter. Kind of each has their own different level. Uh, I do, they're get, putting out the Twitter 100. I don't think we're making it. It would be nice. But I'm pretty certain we're not the 100 most important sports accounts. But it was cool. I don't know if you saw this. Uh, we got recognized, and I say we because I think you guys are involved in this, we got recognized by uh, Kadon Hoops and Basketball Don't Lie, as Balls Don't Lie, as uh, truly one of the, uh, I guess, one of the top sports basketball tweets kind of for the basketball people. So that was really cool. Uh, so thanks, guys, because this is all, we're, we're breaking new ground doing stuff no one's done before in regards to just try you know, covering a team from the social media aspect and a play-by-play announcer communicating, uh, you know, close to three, close to 24-7. Uh, and it's only working because you guys are, are following it. It would have stopped a long time ago. So thank you. Thank you very much. I talked to Ty Corbin for a little while today. I've got to write a piece for KSL.com. Um, and, and really, you know, if we think about it, Ty took over midway through a season. Then he got that no lockout last year. And I, we talked yesterday about how Kevin McHale had commented that, that he had a hard time getting along with his players because of that. So I'm going to do a piece on just how he finally gets to run a camp. And the first thing he said to me was more attention to detail and more elaborate. Uh, He talked offensively, interestingly. Just, um, you know, we don't have to rush through stuff. We can get consistency. Last year we just put it in. Once we thought guys kind of had it, we had to move to the next thing because we didn't have time. Uh, We never got into all the different options on things or uh, and, and we didn't really get a chance for teammates to understand each other. And he says, look at the first few games. Our guys just had no idea where everybody was going to be on the floor. And we got better as the year went on, <clears throat> but we didn't really get any opportunity to get guys to understand where they're going to rotate defensively, how each guy's going to move offensively, where everything was until they played together. You just didn't get that chance in camp last year. And 
And this year they get to do that, and they also just he kept talking about a lot of different options on things, um, but but as much putting just the time in. You know, last year you might just get it done. It was good enough, and you had to go to the next item because you didn't simply didn't have time. Uh, the other thing that's just dramatically different is that he's seen all these guys all summer. He's been to Mississippi to see Al and Mo. Al was putting on a camp when he was there, and uh, he got to see him work out and see him. He went to, I think, New Jersey to have lunch with Randy Foy. He went to Vegas to see Gordon and Derek. He went to Orlando, saw Ennis and Alec and Kevin. Uh, he's been in Santa Barbara and seen the guys. So he's been just moving around and communicating with players and taking that time to interact with them, and it's just a, it's very different uh, than what he had uh, a year ago, he still has to coach them, uh, he pointed out. But there's more time. Um, the more time, the more understanding you have. And he's just that to him is is the biggest difference in this upcoming year. Uh, I was reading some various things. One was on Utah Jazz 360 and some others uh, recently that the the gripe about our offense has kicked back in. I mean, we just we like to gripe and we don't have anything new. And there's been no news for you know really Kevin Murphy's second round draft pick signings irrelevant. Um, because it was going to happen. Uh, that's one where on the Twitter 100 it never works. Like I put big capital letters breaking. Like I thought that was funny. Like that was I was being very kind of tongue in cheek. Like breaking. We signed our second round draft pick, possibly for a non guaranteed, maybe for guaranteed. Who knows? We expect him to make the team. We probably gave him one year guaranteed, uh, at least. Uh, because we do expect him to make the team. But the um, that was my version of humor and it didn't come across at all. The I can understand why, uh, but I've heard this gripe coming back up recently about the offense, and you know it's too stagnant. We didn't get people involved. I mean, it's the same one. And I'd actually say that it feels right. <laughs> Watching last year, I would I would agree that it feels right. But on the other hand, we were I think we were what seventh, eighth, or ninth best offensive team, depending on the metric. Pretty tough. I mean, our issue was we were twenty second, twenty nineteenth, twentieth, twenty first defensively, depending on the metric. So I'm not sure that I have a huge – I mean, I don't love the go to Al in the post, just sit still, and everybody just waits for the ball to come in or out, get out, or maybe not. Um, and I think there's better things to do there, and maybe we'll see some more of it. However, the real bottom line on all these things is what the end result was, and the end result was that this was the top ten offensive team. If we can be a top ten offensive team, a top ten defensive team will be great. Speaking of being great, our improvement is subtle. I, I, the NBA rank, I think, has moved through all of our guys now. And I thought some I, one thing I think is really interesting is some of our mid-level better players, um, I feel like they are not getting judged well enough. Sorry, I'm just pulling up what the NBA rank is. Um, I feel like maybe they're not getting enough credit, though. I, I you know, I, I've been, I think, pretty open about this. I have no idea where I would put Al Jefferson on this list. Al Jefferson single-handedly might be why I'm not doing the list. I mean, he's one of the few players who 2010s, and he's, he's got all those other things. He's not a great defensive player, and they rank him 44, and it's probably about right. But then you put in the fact that he's a center, and frankly, there aren't a lot of guys that at the center position that can do that, so he's probably got to be higher than that. And then you consider the fact that he he can score late in games in the post, and he probably has to be higher than that. Like, go that he doesn't defend, and he did pass pretty well last year, and his lack of his turnovers was incredible. So anyway, but what I think is interesting, and it might be where Marvin Williams fits the best in us, just looking over the, the list of numbers, I feel as though some of our top guys, like I think Hayward's better than 123, and I think Favors is better than 89, and I think Millsap's probably better than 53 in the way he's performed. That our top level guys, I'm not sure, got enough credit. On the other end, C.J. Miles is not good enough to be 250. Josh Howard certainly wasn't good enough to be 216 last year. Um, frankly, I'm not sure Cantor was good enough to be 205 last year. So I feel like because we're under the radar, our guys that were bad didn't get fully exposed. Our guys that are good, we're seeing the subtlety that other people may not. Uh, if Randy Foy, using NBA rank, thought this was worth noting, if Randy Foy replaces Watson and Tinsley, those two guys are ranked 323 and 347. 
Foy was ranked 201. It's a nice upgrade. If he doesn't, and he just replaces Josh Howard, according to NBA rank, Josh Howard was 216 and Foy was 201. Dear God, I hope Randy Foy's better than that. Um, Mo Williams has actually stepped down to Devin Harris. Uh, 125 to 108. We'll see. My numbers don't totally disagree with that, uh, but they don't show toughness. And then Marvin Williams is 163, and C.J. Miles is 250. So there's an upgrade there. Um, it's kind of interesting to see that ring. So Foy is an upgrade, and Williams is uh, Marvin's an upgrade. I, I think people are really going to like Marvin. Uh, f- how about this tweet? Like, <laughs> uh, I did the podcast with Ian Furness last night, which we just do because it's fun, and you guys, have, people have liked it. And I, hey, if you're a BYU fan, I get that us doing two guys on the 12 is not the most interesting thing to you. Um, so I get it. Uh, we do it because we're good friends, and we like it, and frankly, we're getting really high levels, uh, both in and state and out of state on it. Uh, so I record that last night, and then I get this tweet. Wake me up if you ever truly talk jazz. Thought it was jazz first, NBA second. You never talk general NBA. I've blocked like two people ever on Twitter, and that was close to the third. Are you kidding? I never talk general NBA, and I... Oh, come on. Um, so, general NBA for you. The... Interesting story. The Hornets have been working out as a group, but their practice facility became a food stamp distribution in response to Hurricane Isaac. So the Hornets then, as a group, flew to San Antonio, and the Spurs gave them access to the practice facility. And for number one pick, Anthony Davis, got to work with Tim Duncan a little bit. Talk about big-time experiences um, there. Then the other one, Uh, I thought was interesting, Seiko Smith, who uh, we get along with well and have done a lot of things with uh, on our podcast and refs from Hang Time Blog, had five players that he believes could break out this year. And I haven't thought about it. I might have to look around the league a little bit to see what I would do within five. I'm not sure that I concurred with his five. Uh, Goran Dragic was his number one replacing uh, Steve Nash in Phoenix, uh, and I think that's probably a good call, particularly in the sense that uh, he gets the time, he gets the opportunity, and he showed last year what he could do. Marshawn Brooks is another. I, t- I really actually disagree with that. I, I think Marshawn Brooks' second half of the season was discouraging, and some of the problems that he might may show based on um, – just his lack of shooting and some other areas. So I would I would disagree with him on that. Um, he his other two. I'm doing this off the top of my head, and I just pause because I know the third. I'm trying to think of who his other two were. He had Drajic. He had oh Kenneth Fareed, um, who during the playoffs was a 10.10 rebound guy and uh, playing with JaVel McGee. Uh, um, Yeah, I think he'll come into the forefront more. I think if you're on the Nuggets, you really know who he is, and other people probably don't know who he is. And then the the other one, I don't remember the other, then Derek Favors, which I, oh, Brandon Knight, and I'm not sure on Brandon Knight. He had an interesting rookie year, but he just, it's not sure what position he plays. He's got some plantar fasciitis problems. He's such a bright kid. I loved him coming out of the draft. I I thought he was um I thought he was going to be terrific, but I I I didn't love what I saw in his rookie year. I I'm very curious to watch this entire rookie class having had a off season of the NBA after being just dropped into that league um the way they were. I think that whole rookie class is going to be very interesting and as I said all of last year I thought the second year players were most hurt by that lockout. So we'll be curious to see how that happens. Uh, and then Derek Favors. He, he has Favors there. Um, you know, 12 points, 10 rebounds during the playoffs, and probably going to, hopefully, I think he's going to explode. Uh, NFL talk for you. Back to the preview that I did to open the year. 
And that is, did I, I really just sit here every day for like 15 to 20 minutes and just talk? Oh, thank you for listening to this and humoring me as though you somehow find it interesting. Uh, I talked at the beginning of the uh, my theory in the NFL is always that the, and by the way, if anyone followed my 0-1 home team versus 1-0 road team, you're welcome. Uh, my theory always is that the pundits in the NFL are a year ahead. Uh, if you go back a year and look at who everyone's talking about, you usually can find out who's going to win that year. And sure enough, right now, there's two teams. The, in the NFC, the Niners are exceeding all expectations. I couldn't have been more wrong on them to begin the year. <coughs> and and they're, they're the best team right now. The, the other two that jump out at me are the two teams that I actually picked in the NFC when the year started, and, and that is the uh, Atlanta Falcons, who everyone loved a year ago. They, they had added through the Julio Jones trade. Now they have Asante Samuel. Uh, I, I really like what I'm seeing out of Atlanta. Uh, and the other one I find very, very interesting is Philadelphia. They're not playing well, and they're 2-0. and oh. And that kind of is a huge statement that they're that they're two and zero and not playing well because they had you know la- a year ago we believed in them because they had this incredible uh, plethora of talent and then they didn't come together off th- off the lockout and had all sorts of problems they had a bad defense coordinator I mean they really had a coaching problem a defense coordinator so I would keep an eye on those two teams in the AFC over in the AFC. You just go to the Texans, were the best team in the NFL uh, when when Schaub got hurt. And what people are forgetting is that they were the best defense in the NFL when Schaub got hurt. And the, when T.J. Yates took over offensively, they stayed in games because of how incredible the defense was. So far this season, Houston has allowed 17 points. We're all going crazy about the Niners. The Niners have allowed 41 now, Houston may not have played Green Bay and Detroit, which are two pretty high-powered offenses. They've played Miami and Jacksonville, which are two pretty terrible offenses. But there is a, a saying in football, as well as some other sports, <coughs> how you do against the lesser teams and whether you blow them out often will tell you more about a team than what they do against the best teams. And Houston fits into that. The other one that's a year off is last, it goes back to the year issue, is a year ago everybody thought this was the year of the Chargers. Then they got rid of Vincent Jackson, some skill players, and since fantasy football dominates all analysis, everyone disbanded and said San Diego, now they've turned, they've given away, but watching San Diego, I think their defensive line looks better than I've ever seen it. They have faced two of the best running backs in the NFL so far in McFadden and Chris Jones, Johnson. Both of them have struggled so far this year, but McFadden 15 carries for 32 yards against the San Diego Chargers. And Chris Johnson last week, as Tennessee just looked awful in that game, Chris Johnson ended up with <clears throat> eight carries for 17 yards. I'd keep a real eye on San Diego. Um, and I think they've just, they, they're deeper and they don't have as much flash, and they do all the things you actually have to do to win to be better in the NFL. So those are some NFL thoughts that I wanted to get out. Yesterday, I didn't get to. Um, Utah, Arizona State comes up. Uh, Boise State, BYU Thursday. I, I just I talked about this yesterday. I just think the mental grind on BYU. Uh, I think defensively, BYU, if they're on their game, should really shut down Boise State. Their, their offense is off, their system's not running yet, and they don't have enough time between last week and this week to get it fixed. I think com- going forward, as they get a drop in opponents, they'll probably pick up, but they also uh, will have some time. Uh, I I think the other – Utah is interesting to me. Utah played Arizona State last year and was really – it was close for a while, and they were pretty outmanned. I mean, it, they just eventually kind of got outmanned. I, I, I don't think that happens again. On the from the defensive side of things, but I'm curious the speed and athleticism on the wing on the outsides for Arizona State looked very impressive against Missouri and looked incredible uh, against Illinois. I mean, really, they're flying around, and I th- I think Utah can match that, but it will be curious. They have not played that yet, um, 
And, but defensively, they were pretty fabulous on Saturday. And I would suspect they would be equally as fabulous on the uh, on the road. Trying to get any offense going, it's going to be awfully tough. Uh, the, the the good thing on Hayes is he's just not making mistakes. And I think the other good thing is Brian Johnson and Hayes are are pretty tight. I know that uh, Brian was the first one a year ago, kind of told me Hayes might be all right when I was covering the Utes. And I think they understand each other. And I I really think that that first and ten at the 39 yard line play call the other day uh, for me was was a really telling play call by Brian Johnson of understanding who he has as a quarterback and playing to the talent and and one thing is Hayes as as he gets closer to the goal line has has really really scuffled um, if you go inside his numbers a little bit and and look at it he just once that once they get closer inside the 40 it he he just doesn't have that. Um, last year, particularly this year, he's been better. This year, he's actually all right. He's eight to twelve, but some of that uh, and hasn't made the same mistakes. Some of that's a little misleading. The year before, it was, and we need a bigger sample size. But the year before, it was not good. It was um, it was a pretty putrid. I think what was it? Gosh darn it, twenty-seven to sixty-one or something like that. I mean, well below fifty percent, and four interceptions inside the forty. You just can't have that. But hopefully, he's progressed. All right, that is that. Talk to you guys soon.